Vinyl heads, we've got a good one coming at you today. J.J. French. And if you don't know who J.J. French is, you're going to know soon. Yeah. Uh, guitarist from Twisted Sister. Practically a music historian. Uh, we were hooked up with him from our show with Roger Coletti. He said J.J. would be a great guest, and he was right. Um, we want to remind all of you to subscribe to our YouTube page. We've got our armory of video snacks is just video growing snacks. and growing. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. it's kind of a catchphrase. We have so. snacks and a whole meal. <laughs> but it's growing, and we want you guys to subscribe. We want you to see the shorts, the unboxings, the full podcasts, all of the treats that, that we and our Vinyl Ventures team are putting together. So let's make a trip back to, I don't know, seven, eight minutes ago when we talked to J.J. French of Twisted Sister. How have you found doing the podcast has has been um, personally or professionally? Well, um, when I told my daughter, who actually is going to be turning 30 tomorrow, when I told her I was going to have a podcast and get paid for speaking, she said, if you're going to get paid for speaking, you're going to be the richest human being on the planet Earth. <laughs> So you like to talk. <laughs> she just said that, Dad, that's ridiculous. I mean, you're just going to be rich. And I said, well, if you get paid for using a cell phone, you'll be the second richest person. <laughs> on the planet. Yeah. It is really so. interesting. It is really interesting how just when it's kind of like the vinyl craze, when, when you think that that vinyl craze wave is cresting, it just keeps going. I mean, it, it, and the podcasts are the same way. Yeah, um, look, uh, I have a lot of interests and I have a lot of friends and um, I didn't know where it was going. I, when I, you know, it's like when I wrote my book, I started writing my book or I started doing my motivational speaking. I didn't know who I was going to be talking to. You kind of dive in. I approached all of this the same way I've approached everything, which is you dive in and you pray that you don't drown. <laughs> and that you pray, you pray you learn enough before you drown. That's really how I've run my life. You know, yeah. did I learn enough before I fucked myself completely? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, and it happened in the bars, you know, we, I mean, the bars were, were uh, playing in the clubs for all the years we played in the clubs was, an, you know, the first in the beginning, I said, wow, you know, this is going to be a little weird because I'm playing in clubs owned by mafia guys. So what does that mean? You know, I mean, what does that mean? I don't know. Am I going to wind up in a box? I mean, I mean, we work for some weird like mob guys, and the the maybe the weirdest uh, mob situation had to do with uh, before I really started running the things in the band, and I was in the band for the very first time. You know, when you played metal or or loud rock in clubs back in the early '70s, the guys who owned those places were transitioning from, you know, doo-wop era kind of stuff and being forced to take rock and roll, you know, and, and against their their will, but they, you know, they had to. And they all talk like, you know, yay, forget about it. The three of you guys over here fucking make you look like a fine box. And they all talk like that, you know, and 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 you know, what 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 the fuck is that? You wear makeup and shit? What is that? Are you gay? I mean, that's you know, you ain't gay, right? No, I'm only dressed like a transvestite because it's like how I get laid. You know, I mean, so, you have to have so, more makeup on than the women to get laid, right? Yeah. So I go, well, you look like a fairy, but you know, we've drawn a lot of people, so I don't care. I mean, it's <laughs> you know, please do not take this, uh, do not take that as an offensive way. That's how it was. That's what you heard, yeah. Right, I can that's imagine. What they, that's what you heard, and um, this one club owner in Jersey City. So they're always telling you to turn down, like you're too loud. Like, <laughs> no matter how small your amps are, you're too loud. <laughs> and uh, they kept telling us we're too loud. And this one club, the club owner says, um, "Hey, listen, for the next half hour, uh, play as loud as you want. No, really, just turn it up." <laughs> that's because they were like killing somebody in the back in the alley. <laughs> We never got asked to turn up before. 
hey, you know, could you make it a little louder? We just got to like muffle the screams, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and the bullets. <laughs> yeah. The bullets, the kneecaps being broken, the jaw being smashed. You know, we need shit to fill that up. So please be my, f- you play Black Sabbath, fucking turn it up. You know? <laughs> turn it up. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it was kind of like, it was weird, but, um, but the band started, you know, as a purely transvestite rock band uh, in the mold of, you know, the dolls and the yeah. dolls, that was yeah. the era. Yep. You know, and look, the only good thing I'll say about the dolls is that they look good. That's the only good thing I'll say about them. They look good. They, they looked really good. If they wore street clothes, you wouldn't have given them the time of day. Yeah. But they looked really good. And they were known in the area in New York. You know, we kind of knew them. But it was, you know, the end of the Fillmore era. So you're talking about the end of an era where you could see the greatest acts in the in the world every weekend for like three dollars. Like Hendrix, Zeppelin, you know, Jeff Beck, The Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, Janice Job on Country <laughs> Joe and the Fifth, Can Heat, Iron Butterfly, Allman Brothers. You know, you could see these bands every week for three dollars and at the end of this amazing three-year, unbelievable run of the gods of rock and roll, the dolls is what we got. <laughs> this is the next coming. Uh, this is this is what this is what New York created. <laughs> I mean, thanks to gave us the dead, the airplane, Quicksilver Messenger Service, there's Steve Miller. And, you know, England gave us, you know, Bad Company, Led Zeppelin, and New York gave us the dolls. <laughs> I, I, and, and all those guys used to go to the Fillmore, so I don't know what happened. I mean, look, I went, I walked, you know, this is 1972, so I was a Grateful Dead freak, an Allman Brothers freak, believe it or not. I was an Allman Brothers Grateful Dead. I was in an Allman Brothers cover band in the summer of 72, and uh, I come back to the city, I was living in a commune in Wilkes-Bar, Pennsylvania with a hippie band, living on a drug dealer's farm. You know, these guys bought a, a farm for 400 acres for like 30,000 bucks in cash because you could do it back in those days. Nobody's asking questions. They had a barn. They invited us up. We rehearsed for two months. We, we played one gig, broke up. And I come home and I'm saying to myself, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? September 72, what am I going to do? What the fuck am I going to do now? I dropped out of high school already. You know, I didn't. <laughs> Yeah, what what am I going to do? And I, I got a subscription to a Cream magazine, and the subscription had um, three albums. It had uh, Ziggy Stardust, it had All the Young Dudes, and it had Transformer. Nice. Oh. And it was like, whoa! <laughs> it was like, uh, you know, it's kind of like the way the Beatles were when you first heard the Beatles in '64. This was the next stage. Excuse me. The sirens you're hearing right now, I am not in the witness protection program. <laughs> We're in the middle of New York City, and someone is probably being murdered as we speak. But, you know, just understand what you're hearing. That's we gotta, we it, gotta turn up the music. Yeah, yeah turn yeah, the music yeah, up. A little louder. You turn it up a little louder. So, um, so, uh, so um, anyway, I get these three records, and I freak out, and I, I see pictures of David Bowie and, I, and the spiders from Mars, and, and I see Mick Ronson, and I freak out and I cut my hair, dyed it blonde, and in essentially 24 hours, I de-grateful dead myself, which is like removing yourself from a cult. You know, I unplugged myself from the cult and that basically caused a lot of problems because all my friends were Grateful Dead fanatics and they basically thought I was out of my fucking mind. <laughs> And I had seen the dead 20, at that point, I'd seen the dead 27 times, which you saw in the documentary. Yeah. I said I saw the dead 26 times on LSD. It was the greatest band I ever saw, but I saw them straight, and it was the worst fucking band I ever heard in my life. <laughs> that was the one time. So, <laughs> all it took was one straight night. <laughs> which, by the way, the, the documentary, I got an email after the documentary came out, said, hey, I saw what you said about the Grateful Dead. It's all the email said. And it was signed Justin Kreutzman. And I'm thought, <laughs> thinking, I'm thinking, shit, the drummer for the dead is is Bill Kreutzman. Could it be a relative? Yeah. So I said, I wrote back, you wouldn't be related to the drummer. He goes, That's my dad. <laughs> That's my I go, dad. I go, I'm so sorry. He goes, No, that was the funniest shit I ever saw in my life. <laughs> I showed it to my father five times. It was so oh, funny. Shit. You know? So anyway, um, so I freak out and, and I say to myself, okay, I'm, I'm a glam, I'm a glare guy. I'm a glam guy. Now I need to go where, where glam people go. 
where the glam people go, Max's Kansas City and the Mercer Art Center, where the dolls were had a residency. My friends knew the dolls, so they said, you got to come down. And they played every Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday for a month, whatever. And I went down every week. And one of those nights, David Bowie was in New York playing at Carnegie Hall. And then came down the next night to see the dolls. And I have a photo of me in front of David Bowie at the Mercer Art Center, you know. And and everything's glitter glammy, but the dolls were pretty unlistenable, but they looked amazing. <laughs> And, and I, I, I walked out of the Mercer Art Center every week going, this got to get better. <laughs> they have to learn better. how to play. At some point, they have to learn how to play. And maybe if they learn how to play, though. So a record company guy comes up to I mean, he's wearing a suit. And he said, you just saw the show. I said, yeah. He goes, what'd you think? I said, well, if they learn how to play, they're going to make a lot of money. That was my quote, right? And and I didn't know I was offending the cognizant who thought that they epitomized rock and roll. That's not the epitome of rock and roll. I'm sorry. That's not the epitome, not, not for me, not for me. I spent years trying to learn how to play my record, my instrument, not having to unlearn how to play my instrument. <laughs> so um, so uh, anyway, I needed a band. I needed a band. And that the hippie Allman Brothers cover band that I was in, the drummer of that band, they were all Jersey guys. And, and uh, that drummer had an agent, a booking agent. And that booking agent said, I need a a guitar player for a a glam band, a glitter band like the New York Dolls in Jersey. And he goes, I got just the guy. (laughs) I got the guy. transformed from an Allman Brothers guy into one of your glitter clowns. Wait a minute. Did you just say glitter clowns? Yeah, into one of your glitter clowns. He's perfect. So so he gives my my, uh, phone number to to, uh, the drummer who is the drummer for Twisted Sister, isn't it? It was, it was called Silver Star. And the guy called me up and he said, um, and it's in the book, it's in the documentary, mm-hmm. you know, he goes, hey, you know, he talks to me like he's Rocky Balboa. I mean, I'm from New York City, so I don't like <laughs> usually go use guys, the tree use guys. That's not normally how I speak, but that's all these guys speak. You know, I've seen you guys at something. That's going to be on my gravestone. You know, I've seen you <laughs> guys at speaks i've seen news at the mad hatter i've seen news here but that's you know i get it you know this is okay so the guy goes I, I, he goes use in the glitter use in the glitter okay. yeah i said i i said wheeze in the glitter uh, wheeze <laughs> wheeze yeah. so uh so he says so he says okay what are you into i said bowie reed mop the hoop like perfect this is it we want you and at that point you know this was like um December of 72. So I had spent the next three months learning every song on Transformer, every song on All the Young Dudes, every song on, on um, Ziggy Stardust, because these were monumentally phenomenal records in my life for me. Incredibly important records yeah. for me. And, uh, and I went to the audition and I got hired right on the spot. And, and I just said to them, the name, the band was called Silver Star. And I said, that is the worst fucking name I have ever heard in my life. I said, one Quaalude and nobody will remember the name of this thing. <laughs> oh, shit. And uh, the lead singer, the original lead singer, which is not D, um, uh, the original lead singer, uh, we had we rehearsed one day and we were living in, Ho- in Hohokus, New Jersey, which is near the Jersey border, um, uh, Jersey, New York state border, about maybe 30 miles north of Manhattan in a basement. And, um, you know, he went out and got drunk and he and he called the house phone and I picked up the phone and he was at a bar and he goes, I love the great name. Oh, it's a perfect glitter band name. It was his sister. I went, wow, well, that's. So I went down to the basement. I told the guys, Michael just thought of the most amazing name. And I give him all the credit in the world. Unfortunately, I mean, and I do mean, unfortunately, the reason why he's not in the documentary is because he suffered um, a brain injury. Uh, he got hit by a car and he doesn't remember. Yeah. He doesn't remember anything. So when we were going back to interview former members, I couldn't interview Michael because, I mean, imagine this. I'm giving him the credit for thinking of the name, and he has no recollection that he ever thought of it. Oh, and, yeah. and, and that's the truth. So th- that's kind of like how it all – that was really the, the, the beginnings of all. Was it, was it 72? 70, uh, December 72. Yeah. That's yeah. when I was okay. back. So you got out of the farm, and now you're, now you're in a basement in Jersey. Yeah. So, so here's the here's the thing, right? When a young musician asks me for advice, you know, like a young kid, like twenty two, whatever, and he says to me, you know, give me some advice, and I said, giving you advice is a waste of time because my life 
what we saw and what you are dealing with today are nothing in common. And he goes, how do you mean? I said, trust me, what we experienced in the economic structure that we looked at has nothing to do. He goes, well, how do you talk about that? You're rough. And I said, look, I said, let me put this in perspective, guy. I said, when I was 20 years old in 1972, if I walked up to a 70 year old musician, which there were many in my neighborhood in Manhattan, you know, professional guys who are jingle guys, orchestra played at you know, Carnegie Hall or on the television shows, whatever, plenty of professional guys in the late 60s, early 70s in my neighborhood. If I walked to any, if I walked up to a 70 year old guy in 1972 and said, can you give me some advice? He'd look at me, he goes, I was born in 1902. <laughs> and, and he goes, and my first band was before World War I. And we were backing a young lady in a hotel bar that has nothing to do with you wearing women's clothing, playing through martial amplifiers in a, in a mob on club in New Jersey. I'm sorry. It's a different world, right? So I look at these young people, I go, listen, man, when we started, gasoline was 29 cents a gallon, okay? Hotel rooms were $19.95 a night. House rentals were $300 a, a month. Electric bills were like $10 a month. A truck rental was $25 a week. You got paid $150 a night, guaranteed six nights work, a, uh, six nights a week work. That's $900 a night. With that economic profile, you can set up a business. Today, gas is $5 a gallon. A house rental is $5,000 a month. Truck rental is $600 a week. Hotels are $300 a night. And you're still getting paid the same $150 fucking dollars. Yeah. There's no way my life relates to yours i said you have social media you have a whole different thing now you can create your own music you can go online you you know and they said yeah but help me out i said why help you out nobody helped me out i figured it out i was 20 years old i figured the fucking shit out like you know it's like i i say in my motivational speaking observe your playing field look around you find a band that's a little bit more successful than you figure out what they're doing copy that for a while till you get to the next level then look at the band maybe above you right above that one because you know what? Here's the truth, man. Before you the Beatles, you better be better than the band next door. Very simple. You yeah. know, very simple. I mean, it's not, that's not rocket science. No. That's just business acumen. Yeah. And luckily, that I came from that world. And uh, so I understood it. And that's kind of like how it happened. You're talking December 1972. When did Twisted get their deal? Was it? Well, the Secret Records deal was December 1982, and Atlantic's okay. deal was December. 83 mm -hmm. so it was, it, was woodshed, it was basically woodshedding for 10 years yeah but and in a, the was, in the documentary you guys talk about the sheer number of people that you would bring to these clubs these clubs were big enough for 1500 2000 people at the time yeah, right 5000 5000 5, yeah the clubs the clubs held up to 5000 people now look let me be clear the clubs were as small as 150 people mm -hmm as big as 5,000 people. And so it depends on where you were in the pecking order of success and how many people you could draw. So, you know, that was the, um, that was the way that worked. Uh, it, the more popular you got, the bigger the rooms you played in, but they were rooms that were copy bar rooms. That's the part that I need people to understand that you could learn how to be great as a copy band. But I'll give you another statistic, which is totally terrifying. And guaranteed to make people who are listening to this thing starting a band want to quit and learn code, okay? <laughs> and and that is this. When a young musician talks to me about how long his band has been together, and they go, we've, I say, how long? And they go, two years. And I say, how many shows have you played? And they, they very proudly go, we've played about 50 or 60 shows in two mm -hmm. years. Now. And I'm sitting there going, how long are the shows? Like 45 minutes, 50 minutes? Yeah, yeah, you played like 50, 60 of them, two years? Yeah, that's, that's impressive. I said, in the first 30 months of Twisted Sisters' existence, which is March, excuse me, April 73 to September 75, that's 30 months, we played 3,450 45-minute shows. <laughs> because that's all you did. 450. So you're, so talking, if, you're talking like five sets a night. Four, six nights a week. Six nights a week. Oh, man. Yeah, every night, every, every month, every night. And the, and the grind, and the grind, and the grind, and the grind. And when you're grinding out, you know, and you're grinding. And you know what? Uh, if you're not stupid, you're learning lessons every night. If you make a mistake, you're not making the same mistake the next night because you're doing it. It's kind of like, um, you know, baseball is different from any other sport because their season is 
so long and they play so many games. When you're playing 162 games, yep. you know, a lot of people think like baseball players are blasé when they lose. No, because they say tomorrow I'll win. You know, like tomorrow I'll win. Because they can come back from a bad day the next day. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of baseball players have over basketball, over football in particular, where every week, you know, stands out as a momentous, you know, week. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge sports fan. But baseball players, you know, they're kind of like, if I don't do it today, I'll do it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know? And that's kind of like how it was in the bars. You know, if you fuck up now, if you screwed up that song arrangement or the audience didn't react and, and, and you figured out why, you, know, you could try it the next day. You just retooled yourself. I, I, and this becomes part of my motivational speaking gig when I talk about, you know, uh, tenacity. I mean, I take the words twisted in my book, T-W-I-S-T-E-D, and I turn that into a learning um, lesson, which is every letter of twisted tenacity, wisdom, inspiration, stability, trust, excellence, and discipline. These were the seven rules that we live by. I can't tell you that we designed ourselves that way. <laughs> I can say that we became that. You know, we became it because um, you don't know what you're capable of until you're in the middle of doing it. And right. that's when you understand what you're capable of. But, you know, you can take all the courses you want in school. Nothing replaces doing it. And when you, I'm sorry, when you ask about the podcast, the same thing. Nothing replaces the podcast. I have to keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And you get better at it. You get yeah. better at asking questions. You get better at listening. You know, it's all part of the learning curve. So those nine or 10 years you're in the trenches, did you think about giving up? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, you know, uh, we were rejected. Like I say, we were turned on more times than the bed in a whorehouse, and we came back more times than Freddy Krueger. But the thing is that um, every time the rejections hit, the one luxury that we had, and this is really a luxury that bands do not have. If you're playing four or five nights a week, and you're playing in clubs that are averaging, let's say by that point when we're doing the demo business, we're, we're playing clubs that, that average 1,500 to 2,500 people a night. And you get a rejection letter in the afternoon, but you go out to play a club with 2,500 people in it. You can say to yourself, we don't suck. Mm -hmm. They're wrong. You know, they're wrong. We're good. Because we have the ability immediately to get the feedback that we're on the right track. And that's a luxury nobody has and they'll never have again. So... Um, the, to answer your question, only one time did it finally did I finally say to myself, maybe it wasn't meant to happen. And that was at the last moment before the last Hail Mary was thrown by Dean at a live show, which you can watch on YouTube. Um, and you put Twisted Sister, the tube in and which begins and ends the documentary. Because the beauty of the documentary has nothing to do with we're not going to take it. I want to rock. It just yeah. has to do with the struggle. Yeah. You know, the band had been turned down so many times. We were so cynical about ever being signed. I mean, there was when Secret Records said they were going to sign the band, they, we'd already been turned down about 20 times. And so when we heard that the guy was flying over from England to see a sold out show, no, no, no. I mean, the conversation was, it was so dark. It was like, He's flying over from England. Yeah, well, the plane will crash on the way over the United States. Well, no, but he'll take. You know, he's gonna be. He'll pick. It, we'll, we'll, we'll pick him up at the airport and drive him up. But yeah, but the car will crash on the on the way to the gig. You know. Well, what happens if the gig sold out? Well, it will, but the PA will fall on us while <laughs> while we're playing. Well, what if we're great? So so of course the guy arrives. He gets there on time. He comes in, sees the band, freaks out, goes in the dressing room. Guys, you're great, 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 great. I'm signing you. And we're like this. Take the makeup off. He walks out. <laughs> says to my tour manager, um, when you tell a band they're being signed, they normally are very happy. <laughs> he says, well, they have a history. And, you know, th and so I think he said, 100 bucks says he dies on the way back to the airport. <laughs> uh, $500 says that IRA will blow the plane up on the way back to England. You know, that, this, is how, this is how we got. So ultimately we did go, he did sign us. We did go, we made the album. We made Under the Blade, which is, by the way, the 40th anniversary of the album. It just was released today. It's really cool bonus stuff. Oh, in it. that's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. awesome. yeah, it just came out today, double vinyl. One, vinyl. one album is the actual Secret Records album. The other album is us doing covers in the bars, like whole Zep medley. Awesome. Oh, 
Awesome. It's really, you'll blow, you'll hear D sings up, hear us play Zep. 1976 will blow your mind. It's, it's amazing. I anyway, can't wait to hear it. Yeah, really, that's getting added to the collection. <laughs> yeah, so, so what happens is we, um, you know, we, we finish the record. We play a couple of big festivals and we think this is it. This is it. This is it. This is it. Finally, this is it. And we come back to the United States and we do a final run of dates around the bar scene in the, in the New York City tri-state area. And, and we take out these ads on the radio. Twisted Sister, thanks you for 10 years. Thank you for 10 years. Thank you for 10 years. Uh, thank you for so supporting the band. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to England for our first big tour. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no sooner do we finish that set of commercials that our lawyer called up and said, the record company just went bankrupt. Oh. And that at that moment, at that moment, which was September of 82, I think I kind of said, you know what? We have done everything we can do. What We still had something else we pulled out of our hat. But it was the only time that I was so deflated. And, and, and it took a bit of time to recover from, the, from that information. I mean, it took about a month to like you know, to, 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 to create a, a scenario that we were going to go back one more time, which we did. We went back to England one last time and we're on the tube show and we put on the show of the century on live television. It was our Beatles Ed Sullivan moment. If there was one, that was it. And the reaction of that show was so overwhelming. We got offered eight deals the next day and we signed with Atlantic Records. So, but it, it, that was the, um, that was the moment that, that, that time was the closest I came to going, you know, and I, since I don't drink and do drugs, I'm not, I'm not clouded by this. One just says, and neither does D. D doesn't drink, didn't do drugs, nothing like that. We're totally straight. You know, we're just going, how hard do you have to work? How much do you have to push? How much do you have to believe that you're pushing this gigantic boulder up a hill? And, 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 and um, that was the one time. But you know what? We did recover. We, you know, I always say when, 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 when bad things happen, you mourn them, then you reflect on them, then you retool, and then you reapply. That is one of my teaching lessons in my courses. Um, that's how successful people become successful. You know, if you get pushed back and you get rejected, that's, it happens. And, you know, you're allowed to feel terrible and you're allowed to mourn it. But then you need to reflect on it. And then you have to ask yourself, you have to really be honest with yourself. Like, why did that happen? Like, what really happened? And were you not really ready? You know, people always said to me, "Was it? were you tired of waiting so long to make it? And not that we have a choice, because what happened, happened. But I will say that maybe we weren't ready two years earlier. You know, when we went on that live TV show and we pulled off the show of the century, we pulled it off because we've done it so many times. You know, what do they say? Success is... a uh, that luck is, is preparation meets opportunity. That's luck. So we felt like an 18-month pregnant woman about to give birth <laughs> to octuplets, you know? <laughs> like, we were ready to go. And each, each band member, Eddie and AJ and Dee, we were, we were equipped. We were equipped. We knew exactly. You, you, you could put us anywhere. We'd already played in front of 20,000 people, 30,000 people. We already had that shit down. That was no mystery to us. You know, when you play thousands of shows, it doesn't matter anymore. It's, you're so battle hardened that you can just go out. Look, the truth is that Twisted Sister is one of the 30, one of the only 30 bands in the world that, can, that a promoter will trust to 100,000 people. Think about that for a second. For all the people who think, oh, you suck, or you are, yeah, well, listen, asshole, just understand this. Are you in a band that can play to 100,000 people? The answer is no, you're not. So fuck you, okay? <laughs> we can do it with our eyes fucking closed. And then the process blow away every band on the bill anyway. That's what we do. We learned, we're a very predatory band. We learned how to play really well. We learned how to blow other bands off the stage because that was that was what we were taught to do because our agents said, you want to make more money, blow that band off the stage. You want to make more money, blow that band off the stage and make people follow you, not that other band. So it didn't matter. And by the way, I was friendly with these other bands, but when you're on, when you're, what do they say in sports when you're between the lines? You take no prisoners and we took no prisoners and that's how we developed the stage show that's why in 2016 when we retired the last 17 shows the crowds were anywhere from 40,000 to 110,000 and you could do it in your sleep and i don't mean to say that in a way that sounds cynical or 
or, or or even narcissistic. It just is what it is. That's what we did. We got really good at it, <laughs> you know. Well, we over really over ten years, you you would almost have to. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's put it this way: if you still sucked after seven thousand shows, maybe you're in the wrong business. <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> so yeah. why do you? And I know you talk. You know, the ideas are floated in the doc about it, but there are. And at the time, there are so many affiliate labels of, you know, for Atlantic, all the WIA and all the offshoots and the same for all the other major labels. Why do you think that it was like that for you guys? Well, we're from Long Island and they had a bad rap. Just being from Long Island had a bad rap to it. Just like there was a real look. Like a stigma? Like a stigma. And you have to understand concurrent to us, being so popular in the bars in Long Island at that exact time frame, CBGBs was happening with the Ramones and Blondie and Talking right. Heads and television. And so like, and, and we're only 30 miles away from each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it may as well culturally have been in another continent and the reviewers, you know, the, the hip cool guys, they were going to CBGBs and writing about Talking Heads and Blondie and, and the Ramones and the dictators and all that stuff. All well and good. I'm not knocking any of those bands, but but they went. Oh, they're a cover band from Long Island. They play Bowie and Lou Reed and Zet, whatever. Like not original. So all the bands from Long Island kind of got lumped into that. Oh, you're just a cover band. You're just a you know a copy band. And so that's kind of the stigma. And then the longer you're around, not signed, means the longer you're around, not signed. So <laughs> yeah. if anybody's looking, if anyone's looking for a reason to not sign you, here's what they say. They've been around for a long time. Nobody signed them. <laughs> so we were a victim of they've been around. And that's why we got signed in England. Yeah. Not here. Why do you think, what do you think it was about the the ears of these English folks? Uh, they, heard the, they heard the band's honesty. And they had no preconception of Long Island or whatever. And don't forget, they got us purely as an original band. They knew nothing about the cover stuff at all. Right. So by the time we got to England, we were just a fully... Fully, and by the way, by that point in America, we're playing all originals anyway. But we were able to like, look, Jimi Hendrix went to England to become successful. I mean, yeah. the Snake Cats went to England to become successful. Led Zeppelin wasn't successful in England. They came to America to become successful. Yeah. This happens because your own hometown goes, you suck. <laughs> Go somewhere else, you know? <laughs> That's that. That's what happened. I mean, Zeppelin's got the worst reviews in England. Like nobody cared about Led Zeppelin. They come to America, you know, they're unbelievable. We're freaking out. You go to England, it's like oh, yeah. Yeah. another, you know, uh, whatever, whatever. You know, I think in England they got so blasé with the Who and and the and, and the Jimi Hendrix experience and Cream, they didn't want to have another, you know, that kind of. I think that's. I mean, that makes no. Let me be clear about this. Zeppelin's debut album is one of the greatest records ever fucking made. And how anybody could not recognize that band. And I saw them play that whole album in 1969 in January on their very first tour when they were an opening band. I was sitting in the front fucking row for that show. And it was mind boggling. But how could England's like, oh, no, 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 no. Remember, by that point, England was changing. The world had moved on from what they thought was the Who experience and that, that business. They were going into... I don't know what it was back then. Maybe Linda's Farm or Pentangle or, you know, something like that or Cat Steven. You know, like it was changing. Yeah. And and they no one had no one gave a shit about Zeppelin at that point. That's just this is the way it was, you know. So Zeppelin had been, and by the way, Queen, for years, Queen couldn't get arrested in any place else but South America. They couldn't tour America, they couldn't tour Europe, nobody gave a shit. And, but they loved them in South America and they played in South America. So you know what? Listen, first time Bob Seger ever played in New York, New York, in Long Island was at my father's place. I will never forget this. Night Moves had just come out. I loved the album Night Moves, loved it. Went to my father's place to see Bob Seger. He comes out and he goes, thank you so much. There's maybe 100 people in the room. Nobody knows who he is. He goes, thank you. We just played the Pontiac Superdome last night in front of 90,000 people. This is... <laughs> You understand? Nobody gave a shit in New York City. Yeah. This happens. Yeah. It's very territorial in ways. Look, what was the, the thing about the Grateful Dead? They said, if you want the Grateful Dead to sell out in Kansas, put an ad in the Village Voice. You know, it's like, <laughs> you 
grateful dead fans would fly out to see him in kansas because nobody in kansas would see the dead so this territorialization of of artists it, when you're in the industry yeah and you learn it you the point is you're not necessarily surprised by it it's a phenomenon that happens was it the almonds or or leonard skinner said their biggest market outside the south was suffolk county long island <laughs> so in other words, they would come to the northeast and eh but they play Nassau Coliseum. Everybody would show up in cowboy hats, and, and and you know, and so you say to yourself, "What is it? Want to be cowboys out there? You know, in F one Ford F one fifties or something?" I, I I don't know. Um, I mean, I don't know. But but let me tell you, every one of these bands, including us, are grateful that they got a toehold somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, the Ramones. I happen to really like the Ramones, but they never sold records, and they were never popular anywhere. Okay. But they had a thing in New York City, and that thing in New York sustained them long enough until until they couldn't take it anymore. But but their reputation still grew, but they still never sold records. But they were very culty in New York, and they were hip culty. I mean, I always thought that they were like really good. I saw them in '75, and I, and I just said, wow, they're not the best musicians in the world, but they have a thing mm -hmm. that I love. Like it was powerful, and it was musical. And uh, I mean, for me, not it's not everybody's cup of tea, but for me, I like it. So when people say, how could you like their mom? I said, well, fuck, first of all, fuck you. You like anybody that you want to like. And so I don't need to <laughs> fucking realize to you why I like anything. You know, and if you own a Yoko Ono album, congratulations. fucking lady. I, said, I don't own them, okay? And probably never fucking will. I love Neil Young. I love his voice. I love his songs. I love his acoustic guitar playing. I'm not a fan of his electric guitar playing. That's all. I am opinionated by it. I'm not a fan of his electric plane, but I do admire Neil. So let me get that fucking straight. <laughs> so I don't start with the bullshit, okay? And I'm a big Buffalo Springfield fan, which most of you don't even know who the fuck they are. Oh, yeah. They're but great. I grew up I grew up with Buffalo Springfield again. I grew up with last time around. Do you like you, you? You were into folk music, right? Well, I mean. To a more, degree. More that uh, Southern uh, California York, country. No, 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 no. I mean, New York City guy in the 60s, right? Yeah. That's, that's, that's low, you know, that's Dylan down the village and Tim Harden, Phil Oaks, and the Weavers preceded them, and my parents were Weavers fans and Harry Belafonte fans, and I always heard that shit in my house. But when the Beatles hit, it changed everything. And I was a pop radio guy. I love pop radio. Like, um, you know, Hey Paula was the first pop record I ever heard that met, mattered to me, and, and to most people, they go, God, what a wimpy... A horrible, stupid song. Really? That's the song. <laughs> they expect me to go. I heard School Days by Chuck Berry in 57 and freaked out. I heard Carl Perkins and freaked out. I heard Jerry Lee Lewis and freaked out. I'm sorry. I heard fucking Hey Paula. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> hey, hey, Paula. Uh, I'll marry you. Yeah. So that song was the number one song on the radio <laughs> the week that I was sick from school. I was home. I said to my mother, Give me something already. I'm losing my fucking mind. I'm 11, I'm 10 years old. She hands me a tabletop radio. I plug it in, and all I hear is number one, 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 one. Hey, Paula. I go, whoa, what is number one? <laughs> and, and so when you listen to pop radio in those days, they played the same 20 songs 20 times a day, yeah. right? Every hour on the hour, same 20 songs. So I started listening to pop radio, and, and they went, Tuesday night, the countdown, you know? So I listened to the Tuesday night. Cousin Brucey, and they did the countdown, you know, and they get down to number one, and hey, Paula is still number one. And I, I said to my mother, how does that happen exactly? Like, do you phone up somebody, or is there a worldwide phone number? As I said this to my mom, she, she's like, the fuck you bother? <laughs> so the third week comes along, and the charts change, and hey, Paula is still number one. And the fourth week comes, and hey, Paul is still number one. Now, you know, you're 10 years old. You're trying to figure out how this is happening. You know, come the seventh week, they get knocked out by Walk Like a Man by the Four Seasons. And I freak out and start crying. <laughs> Later, my mother, how could this happen? I thought that was forever. The number one song in the world. <laughs> well, how did you change that? So, so there was a record store in my neighborhood, a little mom and pop record store, you know, and we went up there and, and I walked in. I'd never been in a record store before. It's this musty little record, this little old lady behind the counter. And she's got all the hit charts on the desk and it's like all the singles behind her. And I'm, I am in heaven. I am in church. I am absolutely in church. And I go, do you have a ball? Yes, we do. How much is it? 
49 cents. I go, mommy, can I buy? Yeah, you can buy. I look at the woman and I said, if I buy this record, will it go back up to number one? Now, how stupid do you have to be? <laughs> and, you know, she didn't say to me, you're a schmuck. It's run by the mob, you fucking idiot. Like, <laughs> it's whatever the mob wants it to be. It'll be the number one song next week. Don't you know how that works? I didn't know. So anyway, it didn't go back up to number one, but it, 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 it addicted me to the charts. Oh, yeah. And then and then that was in 63, right? Then Kennedy was killed in November of 63. And then the Beatles came out basically nine weeks later, which people don't remember what it was that lifted the doldrums off of the youth of America. So you know, yeah. nine weeks later. Was your mother associated with the Kennedy? Well, she worked for, she worked for the Kennedy campaign in New yeah. York City. So she ran the Upper West Side um, FDR Woodrow Wilson Club. So she ran the Kennedy headquarters on 90th and Broadway. And then she worked for Bobby Kennedy in 1968 and for a lot of major politicians. So I grew up in that era. You know, you're a New York person and you grew up in New York City. And so what you had, you had a, con you had a perfect um, uh, conf conflagration of politics, rock and roll. You know, it was the 60s, the hippies thing. Sociologically, it all kind of came together. The anti-war movement all mm -hmm. pitched in. And the hippie movement, and and I was perfect. I was born in '52, so in 1967, when Sgt. Pepper came out, I was 15, oh. and that's the beginning. That's the beginning of the whole thing. Yeah. So my first rock show was I went to the see the animals in Central Park in '66, oh. but my first big rock show was the next year. I went to the Murray the K Easter show, and the opening acts were Cream and the Who. Oh my god! And, and, oh, no, and nobody knew who nobody knew who they were. Yeah. At all. Now, I knew who they were because my my neighbor who took me to the show was. He was like an Anglophile guy. Like he got the singles from his buddies who came from England or whatever. So I already heard I Feel Free. I already heard My Generation. I already heard Can't Explain. I knew that shit. But nobody knew who they were. Mm -hmm. And Mark K, um, you know, this was a hot thing. This was this was uh, April 67. He, the Murray the K used to show, for those of you who don't know, back before rock concerts were rock concerts where a band would play an hour or two hours, uh, they they traveled in buses and they did reviews. Just like the old uh, Black Axe, Motown Axe, like, Yep. 20 acts on a bus. Everyone does their three hit singles, right? That yep. was how most of it happened. So Murray the K was he used to do that at the Brooklyn Fox Theater, and he brought that mentality to Manhattan, and he brought the uh, the Murray the K music in the Fifth Dimension to the RKO Theater. So there was 10 bands on the bill, and the headlining act was uh, Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels, <laughs> and Wilson Pickett, and Wilson Pickett Wilson was the Pickett. next one down. But the Young Rascals were the third one, and they had the number one single in the country that week with Groovin. Then there was Ian and Sylvia and something else and blah, blah, blah. And then Cream, who Simon and Garfunkel was in the, this mix or something. Everybody did two songs. So the Cream did I Feel Free in NSU and the Who did I Can't Explain in My Generation. And, you know, you're a 15-year-old kid. <laughs> Holy shit. Whoa. Like, nothing sucked in those days. Everything was great. Yeah. Everything was good. Every band, nobody sucked. <laughs> Every band was great because you're like, you're 15. Wow. Wilson Pickett, wow. Mitch Ryder, wow. You know, Young Rascals, wow. And, and, I, and I met Gene Cornish from the Young Rascals years later, and I said, what was that like back then? You know, you asked me what it's like, right? So I'm asking my kind of heroes, what was it like? And he said, man, you know how much he paid us for those? You have to understand, in those days, they did nine shows a day nine hour and a half shows a day from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. in a round robin. So they did 63 performances in seven days. You got that? 63 performances. Every act played nine times a day, 63 times, two songs. Okay? So that, that's how they did. So he said, um, this is what he said he remembered. So I'm only telling you what he told me. I can't tell you it's gospel. But what he said was... Um, their manager was Sid Bernstein, you know, who brought the Beatles to uh, to America at, Sh at Shea Stadium. He said that Sid, Murray the K called Sid. He goes, I got, he goes, I got my big show and I can't sell tickets. Nobody knows who the fuck Cream and who are. I need someone to sell tickets. And your band has the number one song in the country. They need, I need them to like be on the bill. And and Sid said, well, how much can you pay him? He goes, I have no money, but I'll buy him lunch every day. <laughs> now. That's what Gene said to me. Now, think about this. He's the most powerful DJ in the country, okay? When the most powerful DJ in the country asks you to do 63 shows for lunch, you're going to do 63 shows. Yeah. And 
back in those days. Yep. It's a different world today, right? Definitely. Back then, that's what you did. So, so after seeing them, I was like, wow, I became so addicted to the idea of becoming a rock star, whatever that meant. And then the Fillmore East opened and then the floodgates opened. Like you could just go every weekend, every weekend. You could see everybody. And you know what? In the summertime, you saw them all during the week at the Schaefer Festival in the park for a dollar, <laughs> a dollar fifty. You know, I saw Zeppelin four times in 1969, right? I paid three dollars the first time, three dollars the second time, a dollar fifty the third time and three dollars the fourth time. <laughs> OK. All right. That was that was just Zeppelin. Grateful Dead, I saw five times, three dollars each time. I saw Jimi Hendrix twice that year. I saw the experience of the Garden, probably was five dollars. Fillmore was three dollars. I, I had, you know, the live uh, Band of Gypsies album. I was tenth row center at that show. Nice. Oh man. Well, let's talk about this for a second. If I said to you guys, how many shows have you seen that were made into live albums? Did you ever think about that? That were made into famous live records. I've thought about it, but. I also know that a lot of the live records really aren't live. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but, but but let's just say that the record was released and it said recorded on this day. Yep. Yeah. How many shows have you been to that were ostensibly recorded for the purpose of releasing a live record? I think three. Uh, yeah, for I'd me. say one or two, maybe. Yeah. Seventeen. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Does that make you sick? A little bit. I yeah. At, I was at Band Rock of Ages. Oh, okay. nice. I was at Hendrix, Band of Gypsies, Rolling Stones, all three shows at the Garden oh. right, in 1969. Oh. Rolling Stones, 72 at the Garden. Elvis Presley at the Garden, 72. Um, Mott the Hoople Years Theater, oh, 74. Nice. I mean, so I wrote an article for, for uh, Goldmine Magazine, among the other things that I do, which is, how many shows have you seen that were turned famous shows that turned live records? I said, I 17. Now, to be fair, nine of them were Grateful Dead shows, which <laughs> made me realize, which made me realize the following the following statement. There's a, you know the phrase of uh, nothing is certain except death and taxes, right? Oh, There's yeah. like the cliche. Yep. There's a third one. Nothing is certain except death and taxes, and eventually every show the Grateful Dead ever played will be turned into a live album. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so. I started going down the list of all the Grateful Dead live albums I had because I saw the Dead a lot. And then I thought, you know, why am I going crazy? Why don't I just call, call my label Rhino and just say, um, here are the dates I saw the Dead. Are there live albums coming out on these dates? And I gave them a whole list. And all of a sudden, records started arriving in the mail. I saw that show. I saw that show. I saw that show. I saw that show. I, saw that show. I, saw, I was fucked up on LSD, so I can't tell you exactly what they were like. <laughs> but I can tell you that I thought they were really good. You know? The best of my recollection. Yeah, of course. I, I uh, you know, I listen. The best of my recollection, the the dead were, were were are have been one of the greatest live acts in the world. So all the teasing I'll say about the Grateful Dead for all the teasing I, I'll say about them, their cult love the love making cult of Grateful Dead fans. I was there. Mm -hmm. I was a QAnon member. You know, I was a dead QAnon member. I was. I drank the fucking Kool Aid with LSD <laughs> in it, okay, and uh, and uh, and and they were they were truly amazing. And and I used to observe the audience. They used to drive their audiences crazy. I think I said to myself, well, I'm in a band. I want to be able to drive my audience. I want them to religiously love me the way they religiously love them. The Dead have a unique, you know, Springsteen has the same thing, but the Dead have a very unique bonding, and, and I I don't take that lightly. I I really don't take that lightly. And and so I saw them a lot. But anyway, the bottom line, the 17 shows that I saw. And, and, and as my wife said, if I told you all the shit that I saw, you just sit there and throw up and go, shut the fuck up already because I'm <laughs> sick of hearing what you saw. I saw private concerts. I saw, I saw Clapton and Winwood, Dr. John, Rick Gretsch, um, uh, uh, Delaney and Bonnie play a private party with 20 people in a small club. One night in the middle of the summer, 1969, I walked into the Ungano's, which was an Italian restaurant on the Upper West Side. They happened to have rock bands and I walked in, there was a private party, and Free was the opening act, and they played on the floor. It was their first tour. There was no, they were just, they were on the floor. I walked in, <laughs> there's all, there's da, 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 right there on the floor, there's 20 people in the room. There's that kind of shit. I saw Mountain. Paul Rogers didn't need a PA, JJ. <laughs> no. I saw, I saw Mountain the night before Woodstock. Nice. The night before Woodstock, he played the, Mountain played three shows before Woodstock. Do you understand that? Three shows. 
the show before Woodstock was at Angano's. I walked in Angano's that night. They played, and there was like maybe 30 people in the room. And Leslie goes, uh, we're doing an encore tomorrow, uh, upstate New York, like that, like that kind of And so, you know, that kind of shit will make you ill. You know, oh, I man. walked in one night, I walked in one night, Muddy Waters was playing, the club was packed, there was no seats. Mickey Angana said, why don't you go sit on his amplifier? I walked around on the stage and sat on Muddy Waters' Fender amp the whole night. You know? <laughs> These kind of um, experiences on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis, fed my um, love. So did is that when did you first pick up a guitar? Uh, when I was ten, I started playing in camp. My brother was a, ten years older than me. No, taught me how to Travis pick, which is something I've never had to use in Twisted Sister. But <laughs> um, and then and then I didn't play for five years. Now here's a weird thing. So the Beatles come out. And I'm eleven. You know, I freak out. I didn't care about playing their songs. I didn't really care about. It. But when I was fifteen, I heard the Paul Butterfield Blues Band. And I heard their, their debut album and I flipped out. And that was the switch. That was the switch. Hearing Mike Bloomfield play guitar on the Paul Butterfield Blues album was the switch that lit the fuse. I needed to do that. I needed to learn how to do that. I needed, I wanted to buy a guitar like him. So I got 135 bucks, went down to 48th Street and bought a Fender Telecaster. That was the first real guitar I bought. Before that, you know, I was in a band in junior high school with me and this Chinese kid named Bing Gong, who lived across the street in the projects with me, and a drummer named Paul Herman, and my name is John, so we called the band John, Paul, and Bingo. That was the name of the band. <laughs> and and we, um, we, uh, we, we played a school talent contest. In, we, we played a school talent contest in eighth grade, and, and you know, my voice, my voice sucks. That's why God created Lou Reed, you know, so I could sing cover material, you know? And, 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 and uh, so we did like a Rolling Stone because how do you fuck that up? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then and then we did a song by the Fugs called "I Couldn't Get High." And I don't think a thirteen-year-old kid singing "I Couldn't Get High" in the school auditorium went over too well. <laughs> and 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 they pulled us off the stage and we were blown away by a band called the Bats. And then I joined the Bats as a bass player. I bought a bass, and then uh, joined a whole bunch of other bands. I don't know if you know who the Blues Magoos. Yeah. Are, yeah, but the they have songs, we ain't yeah. seen nothing yet. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You know, so, so Pepe from the Blues Magoos is a good is a good friend of mine. Oh, that's great. But, but Pepe, the reason why he's a good friend of mine, and we became friends many years later, because Pepe, of course, has no recollection of the story I'm going to tell you. <laughs> but at the age of 14, we go down to the village one night, and we're walking, you know, uh, Jimi Hendrix was still playing around the corner, and Jimmy James and the Blue Flames, all right? And uh, the Love and Spoonful had just been signed out of the Night Owl Cafe. So the headlining acts at the Night Owl were the Blues Magoos, Clefts of Lavender Hill, and the Brooklyn Symphony Orchestra. And their names are on letters on the marquee. But we're like 14 years old. you know. And, and the biggest amps we ever played through were these little boxes. You know, we never yep. played the big amps. And we walk into this club at like 10 in the morning. And the drummer in this little band we were in says to the manager of the club, can we play on that gear? Because that was real, real, real gear, like on stage, like real, like big abs. And he goes, if you kids clean up this whole bar, I'll let you play. So like idiots, we clean up the whole bar. And he thought we wouldn't, but we did. So he says, go up on stage. So what do we do? We played Wipeout by the Safaris. Nice. The last time by the Rolling Stones. Oh. And for some stupid reason, dedicated follower of fashion by the Kinks. I don't know why, but we did. In the middle of that song, the Blues Magoos walk in. Now, you have to understand, we're 14, they're 17. So to us, they're adults. Yeah. And they walk over to us, and they, and Pepe walks up to me, right? And he goes, get the fuck off my amp. And absolutely traumatized and something. We're all cowering in the corner, and they're writing a song or something. Okay, many years later, many, like, 20 years later, I'm hosting a cable show, and the guest is Pepe Castro. Except this time, Twisted Sister's famous and everything. So Pepe comes on, hey, it's such a pleasure to meet you, Twisted, I love Twisted. I said, Pepe, let me set the scene for you. He goes, what? I said, Night Owl Cafe, 965, 66, yeah. Seven. Um, your drummer, Jeff, played on the floor, drum kit on the floor, right? Sling on, right? He goes, yeah. I said, bass player, Lion, stood next to him, and he played a Guild Thunder bass amp. He goes, yeah. I said, next to him was your guitar player, Mike Esposito, and he was playing for a Beatle, a Super Beatle amplifier. And he goes, yeah. I said, and next to him is your amp, which is a Vox Essex amplifier. And you're playing a Fender Telecaster with a Vox treble boost 
plugged into it. And next to you is a purple <laughs> torpedo with the words Blues Magoos and yellow stencil on a purple torpedo. And he goes, <laughs> how would you know that? I said, because you threw me off the fucking stage, you motherfucker. <laughs> and, I, and I grabbed by the neck. He goes, dude, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I said, I, just watching his face was fine. So I had Pepe on my show. We've discussed that. Was like, that was one of those. That was just one of those like cool things, you know. So that was that's what life was like. That's that's yeah. incredible. I think sometimes when musicians become famous, they kind of get pigeonholed into the type of of music that they're they become known for. Like I I don't think most people would pin you as a as a Grateful Dead fan. So did you remain a fan of them through? No, no. The truth the truth was of all the bands that I was addicted to. And I was addicted to all of them. When I walked away from the dead, I felt I had to leave that world behind. So I didn't listen to the dead for years and years and years. That, that's the truth. And all kidding aside with the dead, because I, I immensely respect what they pulled off. But um, my record label is Rhino, and that's the dead's label. Yep. And the president of Rhino happens to be pretty much like the guy in charge of, of selling their catalog. So he's a super, super dead freak. Except I'm older than him. I saw all the shows that he wishes he could have seen. <laughs> and so so he hates me because I was at every one of these shows that he wishes he could have been at. And uh, with all my jokes aside, all my jokes aside, The Dead played in New York last summer. Well, they played this past summer, but the summer before that, they played it at Shea Stadium or at the City Field. And he said to me, you haven't seen The Dead since you walked out on them in 1972. Maybe you should come and see him. So I went to see The, the Dead with you know, John Mayer playing. Mm -hmm. And you know what? It was enjoyable. And... It was all it was enjoyable because I spent so many hours of my life listening to them live. Like I really was into them. You know, people maybe aren't into Oxal Moxo, uh, you know, the, the or Anthem of the Sun. I was really into that stuff. Like I loved it. And I also loved the you know, Pipe of the Gates of Dawn by Pink Floyd. Mm. You know, that's why I love Sid Barrett, because I loved that record. That record is the most psychedelic record they ever made. I mean, compared to Sgt. Pepper, Sgt. Pepper's music from Big Pink compared to fucking Sid <laughs> Brain yeah. milking out on wax on you. Like, like, and I love, you know, we can talk about Beatles all day long. I worshipped Sid Barrett and I worshipped Piper at the Gates of Dawn and I had tickets to see them with Sid just before he freaked and he never made that show. Oh. That was the show from where that was canceled. What a bummer. Because I think he lost his mind at some point, and that was the end of it. So I never saw Sid with them. But uh, early Floyd were very meaningful. And then, you know, I went through a big Who period, mm. saw them many, many times, you know, a big Zep period. And, you know, if you look at the if you look at the Beatles, Stones, Who, Zep, Floyd, like that kind of the Mount Rushmore of rock. The thing I find interesting, you, you know, your, your show is like, you know, this vinyl show. I, I kind of came up with this like philosophical view of, England versus America. And I'll just throw this in your lap for a conversation for another time with another artist. But why is it that if you think of the greatest artists of all time, you're thinking Beatles, Stones, Who's Up, Floyd, Queen, like it's all British. Mm -hmm. but you think about the, the, the individuals, they're all American. Mm -hmm. You know, it's Jimi Hendrix, it's Bob Dylan, it's Frank Sinatra, it's Aretha Franklin, it's James Brown, it's Chuck Berry, it's Roy Orbison. It's, it's just, it's like, not to say we don't have good bands here. Don't get me wrong. Yes, Metallica is good, Doors are good, Birds are good. But we have individuals that are legends and they have bands that are legends. I just find it interesting. And by the way, doesn't mean you don't have individuals that are legends. Yeah, you got Elton John. Yeah, you got David Bowie. You know, you've got Rod Stewart. I get I get that. I do get that. But for the most part, the Mount Rushmore of rock is Beatles, Stones, Susan Floyd, Queen, probably is the Mount Rushmore of rock. And the Mount Rushmore of rock and roll is Elvis. You know, mm -hmm. it's Elvis, Chuck Berry. And it's Little Richard, and it's James Brown, Buddy Holly, that, Buddy Holly, exactly. It's individuals versus group. I just find it just curious, a curiosity on mine. JJ, that that is a really, really interesting yeah. point. And I want to challenge you. Okay, so you mentioned Mount Rushmore. What's your Mount Rushmore of live shows you've seen? Great question. Because while I was writing this article, I I had a I, first of all. I had to put myself in the mindset of what I was doing that day that I saw that show. You know, I had to kind of yeah. try to remember. And truthfully, in those days, I was a drug dealer and a drug addict. So I was pretty fucked up at every one of those shows. I was pretty fucking wasted. But I was, you know, I when I saw Band of Gypsies, I was 10th row center. I, I stood up the whole fucking show. I, I, Jimmy was 30 feet from me. I'm just staring at this guy going, 
that may be the greatest guitar player you'll ever see in your life. Like, this is just those things I remember, right? Without a doubt, the number one show that I saw had nothing to do with a night that was deliberately set up to go to a show. I was downtown. Someone said, you want to see uh, Mad Dogs and Englishmen? You know, Leon Russell, Mad Dogs. The, 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 the band had, Joe Cocker had left the tour. I walk in on Leon Russell. And I think that is the greatest night of rock and roll I ever witnessed in my life. I get chills thinking about that night. I remember thinking to myself, John, you've seen the most amazing shit in the world. This is the greatest rock and roll band. And we're not talking about this guitar player is better than this one. Or this, Just the totality of the experience. That night with Leon Russell and Mad Dogs and Englishman reigned supreme. And I don't remember the date of it. But that sticks out in my head. It's the greatest night of rock. Close behind that, the three Rolling Stones show, uh, shows at Madison Square Garden in 1969. Because, my God, I uh, talk about an incendiary band at an incendiary time. It was just, you know, Let It Bleed had just come out. You remember the Beatles broke up two months earlier. So, like, this was our saving grace. Like, holy fuck. Like, this was just amazing. The next one behind that was the Stones in 72 on the Exile Tour. Mind-blowing Exile Tour. So, okay. Then you start getting into Bowie, Radio City, possibly. You know, because it was, or, or, or even the Carnegie Hall show six months earlier where they had no, they had no stage props. You know, they ended the show with two Chuck Berry songs and I, and they were dressed, you know, like the spiders from Mars. And I always thought yeah. that was a little weird. You know, then, then we did a gig with, with uh, Uriah Heep, you know, Twisted played on a festival. And, and I walk in an elevator on my way to the gig and there's Trevor Boulder. He's in the elevator. He's just come back and we're going out. And I looked at him. I said, Trevor Boulder. Holy shit. Oh, my God. And then I start to be like, you know, groupie. Oh, fuck. Man, I, <laughs> you. I went. I saw you guys. I said, right or wrong. Carnegie Hall. 72 and it would and it would chuck very oh yeah why we ran out of songs <laughs> and, and mick goes because everybody knows trying to be good and round and round like who doesn't know like, what's the respecting rock band i don't care if you dress like like chicks everybody <laughs> knows that, right? so that was a pretty spectacular one um somewhere in this mix is grateful dead because they were they were Amazing. I just don't know which one, but I'm sure a, a bunch of them would be. Uh, Zeppelin's an opening band. Look, I saw Zeppelin open for Iron Butterfly. And then six months later, they came back and they headlined and did the whole second album. Oh. And you know who opened up for them? The Woody Herman Jazz Orchestra. I have the poster. <laughs> now, Woody Herman and his clarinet, holding his clarinet, and Led Zeppelin. <laughs> the headliner. One of the more wacky shows you'll ever see. In your life, you know, and 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 uh, you know, and Zeppelin was at their peak. They were at their peak. They were just fucking awesome. Yeah. You know, that that night I walked into that private party at Ungano's and Clapton and Stevie Winwood and Dr. John, Delaney, Bonnie, Rick Gretsch, and Jim Kelton. They were jammed for three hours at a private party to twenty people, and I was one of those twenty people. I was sitting twenty feet away from them in a little private party, and they played three hours. How is that not unbelievable? So it's hard to parse through, but without a doubt, that Delaney Bond, that um, Leon Russell Mad Dogs show some, somehow killed me. We, we talk about Leon a lot, and occasionally you'll find one of his records in good shape at a show. I, I absolutely adore him, and, it, and, it, and it's shocking to me how underappreciated. Yeah. He, why do you think it is? Is it just because it's so kind of off kilter? I mean, look, he maybe didn't have the drive that Elton had. Yeah. But Elton loved him. Elton took him out on that last run of dates. You know, the, yep. do you know, was that that tour? Yeah. I went that, to that, tour. that that record is fan fucking tastic. And if you went to the show, Elton was like, Leon is the king. You know? Yeah. The king. Like yeah. That. Something about Leon, I mean, look, his pedigree goes back to Phil Spector. His pedigree yeah. goes back to, you know, it goes back to the, the original Wrecking Crew before, you know, I mean, it was all those guys, Glenn Campbell, the, you know, uh, they all played together on the, every fucking record that came out of L.A. for yeah. like, you know, 10 years. I think he was just too much of, um, of a real musician and less of wanting to be a rock star, but I don't know the guy, so I can't yeah. tell you, I, I can't 
swear by it. But I will tell you that when he ran the Mad Dogs and Englishmen tour, because he was the band leader, yeah. you know, uh, Joe Cocker picked the winner of all time winners. <laughs> the band got together, right? I mean, yeah. it's the all time winning guy that put together. And then, then he went off on his own with the band because he probably said, I got a good thing here. Yeah. I'll, you know, let, let Joe go back and, you know, I'll take this on, on the road, man. My God. I just, I, I, I told this story to someone I don't know, about five or 10 years ago. And they went, I was at that show. <laughs> that was one of the greatest shows in the world. So he must have hit some sort of a universal. Yeah. You know, you, it was just so, a magical show. Now, the greatest show that I never saw live but watched on on video. First of all, Last Waltz, one of my favorite movies. Oh, it's great. Uh, oh, yeah. I, mean, I can watch it a thousand times. Yeah. It, there's Even, th there's a lot going on there. <laughs> there's a lot, a lot going on there, right? And yeah. everybody's at their, everybody's at their best. Yeah. Right? And that's and and I had their I had the producer not Scorsese directed it but I had the producer who hired Jonathan Taplin hired Scorsese mm -hmm. I had him on my podcast so so when when people say to me like what's the what what would you say is the greatest rock and roll experience you ever have I usually just dismiss people I go watch the Last Waltz <laughs> um, watch um, what I say watch Elvis Comeback Special '68 oh yeah. And, and, I, and uh, with the leather jacket, and oh, I yeah. said, and watch this thing called the Tammy Show, which I'm sure you've never heard of. The Tammy Show. They go, what's the Tammy Show? You mean like Tammy? No, I said not like the girl Tammy. What do you guys know about the Tammy Show, right? I've I've, I've heard people about talk that? about it. Okay, well, the Tammy Show, T A M I, stands for Teenage Music International, which has no meaning whatsoever. They just decided to call something Teenage Music International. But what it was, if you don't know. In one afternoon, in Santa Monica Civic Civic Auditorium, the producer of the show brought together Jerry and the Pacemakers, Billy J. Cameron and the Dakotas, Chuck Berry, Leslie Gore, Jan and Dean, the Supremes, <laughs> the Beach Boys, and James Brown to oh. play and the, and, and the Rolling Stones oh. to play in an afternoon. To play in one afternoon, right? One afternoon. And it was filmed for theatrical release the following year. And it came out in theaters the following year in 65, and it was in the theaters and then disappeared totally. And I always heard about the Tammy show because the Rolling Stones are famous for saying the biggest mistake they ever made was following James Brown on the Tammy show. And so I said to myself, what could James Brown have done? Like, what could he have done? Like, how could that be? Well, finally, about 20 years ago, um, a record label, a DVD label came out with the Tammy show because the Beach Boys had taken their footage out. That was part of the deal. The footage couldn't be played past the first year. Mm. So the first, and then no one wanted it uh. without the Beach Boys footage. Mm -hmm. So whatever legal shit they had to go through, Beach Boys allowed it to be spliced back into the show. So they released some Shout Factory Records was the name of the, yep. of the record label. Heard right? of them. Um, yeah, so uh, the guy who ran Shout Factory, a friend of mine, so he gives me the DVD, right? And I take it home, and this is the Tammy show. I put it in, and there's there's Chuck Berry and Jerry and the Pacemakers and Billy J. Kerman and Dakotas and, and Leslie. By the way, Leslie Gore was the biggest star at that yep. point. They were, it was super big. It's my party, and I'll cry for all like, huge, right? Jan and Dean, then the Supremes first time, you know, and then the Beach Boys in their original five-member lineup, you know? Oh, my God. And then James Brown comes on and fucking puts on maybe the greatest performance by a human being <laughs> that has ever been on earth. Like the greatest, greatest performance. And then the Stones come on afterwards. <laughs> and um, it's, it's kind of like, eh, you know, but James Brown puts on. So, so apparently James Brown was pissed off and he said, I'm going to fuck this motherfucker. I don't know who the fuck. Miss Jagger is, but fuck that. Like, and he puts on. Trust me when I tell you this. Tonight, go online. Okay. You should put in James Brown, Tammy Show, Night Train, the song Night Train. Okay. Night Train. Night Train. Put that on, and sit back, and imagine you have to be Jagger to come out after this. Like, <laughs> it's basically like, fuck you, motherfucker. I'm gonna school your ass and like jagger and richards both say you know following james right now they waited what you don't see in the dvd is they waited an hour or two between sets because they needed the place 
just to calm down because and they by the way i've got to give the stones credit they closed the show and the show was so primitive back then that when the show ended and the credits rolled all the acts came out on stage and danced around the rolling stone so you know the, the, the moroccans and those people doing the frug and the holly gully and the monkey and the, it's chuck berry and james brown and and they're all damn the beach boys and everyone's doing the monkey and shit you got to watch that so um, those are my, those are, that's what I tell people. I say, if you don't get a chance to go see live, those three will school you. So, so we're visiting some friends at a wedding and, and, uh, you know, the wedding, the first day you get there, second day is the wedding, third day, and then the fourth day is the, you know, you kind of hang out at the house, maybe if you know the family. So I'm, I'm, I'm at the house, the family who got, of uh, the daughter got married and I'm lying on a lounge chair in the summer. And I'm just like chilling, chilling out. All right. And a guy walks up to me and goes, you're JJ, right? And, and he, they knew my wife, Sharon. You're Sharon's husband. Can I ask you a question? What? What's the best show you ever saw? I'm like, okay. I said, do yourself a favor. Get the last waltz and get Elvis Comeback Special and the Tammy Show. I'm sure you have no idea who the Tammy Show is. T-A-M-I. Just get it. And that's it. And he goes, the Tammy Show, right? I go, yeah. His wife comes over. Dana, this is JJ, you know, he's married to Sharon. Tell him who your father is. She goes, oh, my dad, his name is Steve Binder. He produced the Elvis comeback special on the Tammy show. <laughs> no shit. I went, what? I, I jumped out of my chair. I said, your father was 26 years old when he had to tell James Brown that the Rolling Stones are going to headline. He was 28 when he walked Elvis across the street in Burbank and told Elvis, nobody knows who's, who he is, so you better put on the leather jacket. I said, man, too bad I can't interview him. She goes, what do you mean? I said, well, he's got to be dead now. She goes, not as far as I know. She picks up her phone. She goes, hey, Dad, I got somebody on the phone for you. He handed me the phone. <laughs> he's 90 years old, and he was on my podcast. Oh, that is so cool. That man. is awesome. That is awesome. So I've taken up an awful lot of your time, but the bottom line is this. If you, if you watch the Elvis movie, did you watch the Elvis movie? They yep. talk about Steve on the Elvis movie. Okay. There's a whole section of Steve Bender schooling Elvis on the show. That's the story of Steve Bender. That's so amazing. Those are the kind of things I enjoy. So let's can I, can I talk about the Kennedy podcast really quick. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Really quick. So John Kennedy's 60th anniversary of the assassination is coming up November 22nd. Yep. The number one leading authority on the Kennedy assassination conspiracy. On the conspiracy, be clear about this. If you listen to conspiracy radio like I do for entertainment, you will know that there's a guy named Robert Morningstar who's been the authority on the conspiracy. He's got more th conspiracy theories than anybody else. He's that interviewed more than anybody else. He's on every show you can imagine. He's always quoted. Well, Robert Morningstar actually lives around the corner from my house, and I used to be in a band with his two brothers. <laughs> for real. And so I haven't seen Robert in about 10 years. And I called up one of his brothers and I said, give me Robert's number. I want him on my podcast. And I call Robert. And, he, and I've known Robert for 60 years. Just understand that I've known him since 1965. He's the older brother of two guys I used to be in a band with. In fact, one of the guys, his youngest brother, I asked to join Twisted. He's the only guy to ever say no <laughs> to join the band. <laughs> so I said, Robert, would you, um, I know you're probably overwhelmed. This is crazy. I want you on my show. He said, John, I'll be more than happy to be on your show. So I got Robert Morningstar coming on in which he's going to somehow spill the beans on who really killed them. Show will be taped this week and it'll be on on the 21st of November, the day before the assassination of the show runs. And the second person I have is a woman named Monica Mercedes Perez Jimenez. I uh, was a girl I dated 30 years ago. Uh, her mother, um, her father was the dictator of Venezuela and her mother had an affair with Fidel Castro, had a son with Fidel Castro, was hired by the CIA to kill Fidel Castro, did not kill him, came back to New York. Her mentor was Frank Sturgis, a CIA agent, who was part of the Watergate conspiracy. Frank Sturgis sent her to Dallas the night before the assassination, and she's the only person in the world who could say she was in a car with Jack Ruby and Officer Tippett the night before, and her daughter Monica, who was an ex-girlfriend of mine, is going to be on the oh, show talking. That's you know, so, unbelievable. So that's who I got. Yeah, I've cool. led a kind of weirdly inter interesting life. <laughs> <laughs> JJ, since we're a vinyl podcast, yeah. Just a couple questions about records. Did did you ever did you ever stop buying them, or no. even in the dead days did you? No, 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 no. I have I have a million records in my room, and I I, I, I love records, and I, they always sounded great. I have a really good stereo system, and you guys probably don't even know how crazy vinyl can be. I mean, you may know it's crazy, but maybe you don't know how crazy 
record players have gotten, you know, turntables have gotten. So how about this? The most expensive turntable you can buy is five hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's to play a dollar ninety nine piece of vinyl, and that comes with no arms. You have to buy the arms. And the, <laughs> the, tone, the tone, the tone arms, and upgrade. It's, it's by extra. By the time you put the tone arms on with all the cables and everything, it will be at eight hundred thousand. That's at the most extreme level of crazy. So um, my friends are. I write for audio magazines, and so I go to audio shows, which I was at the Cap Center audio show uh, uh, in Baltimore. I would say that the median cost of tables at that show was 20,000 and the most expensive table that show was probably 90,000 and that's really relatively inexpensive for how crazy and by the way you don't need to spend let me be really clear about this you can get a table for two two thousand bucks i'll blow your socks off and i routinely put systems together for my friends that are maybe five grand six grand seven grand right but i've been a stereo audiophile since i was 15 and bought my first stereo system back then. And, and then I worked in an audio store. So I, I love vinyl. I have an enormous collection of vinyl. I have two Beatle covers, two butcher, butcher covers. Two. That we, two that we boiled off. Yeah. Because they were covered up with the yeah. other picture. Yeah, I bought them for $1.99 each in a cutout bin on Main <laughs> Street. And my friend thought he saw Ringo's apron line. And we bought the records and boiled off the covers, and there were two underneath that. Unbelievable. I've got, uh, I've got some really cool shit. If you have a second, I'll grab some and show you. Like, give me, give me one second. Just some cool stuff. I'll show you. Um, this, uh, this is a seventy-eight of Chuck Berry School Days. Oh, oh. on chess. On, on chess. chess. Oh, so cool. That is so right. awesome. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. Right now. Now, um, I grab my Fillmore program book. So really quick. Remember I said the Who and Cream is an opening act? Remember? Who and Cream? Here we go. Here's the bill. <laughs> oh, my God. Look at that. <laughs> Unbelievable. All right. Um, this... <clears throat> This is, I kept all my Fillmore programs. Don't ask me, as fucked up as I was on acid. And by the way, I saw The Dead as an opening band. Think about that for a second. <laughs> you know what The Dead do as an opening band? They tune up and say goodnight. <laughs> <laughs> Who did they open Who for? Who did they open? Yeah. First time they opened for um, Janis Joplin. Oh, okay. And the second time they opened for Country Joe. And uh, Country Joe said, like, um, he said, you know what, you people in New York haven't seen The Dead as a, as a as a closing band, so tomorrow night I'll let the dead close. So remember, I told you about Woody Herman Orchestra and Led Zeppelin. Feast your eyes on the program. Oh, that's <laughs> so awesome! <laughs> Jesus. Wait a minute. The picture is even better. Hold on. <laughs> the picture is even better. Oh my! Uh, <laughs> like I'm way <laughs> So, uh, I mean, <laughs> oh my you know, God. why do I, I, I mean, there's so much, I have a, I have a, I have two turn, I have two record players, one from 1899 and one from 1902 in my room. Uh, you know, I have a spindle player from 1899 oh, that's and cool. I have a, I have a 78 over there and, um, and, and just a lot of records that I've saved over the years and, and rec I still buy them all the time. I love vinyl and I just got offered a gig to, to write for the tracking angle, which is a vinyl only specialty online magazine. That's awesome. So although I write for Goldmine and Copper and a bunch of other magazines, Michael Fremmer, who's considered the le world's leading authority on analog, asked me at the trade show if I'd write for him. So I'm gonna write for him. I hear numbers out there about, you know, half of the records sold, you know, there's a huge amount of people that don't even have turntables. But Crazy, right? You're even, right. Fifty percent. Right. Yeah. Even, even with that in mind, I, I, I never really stopped buying records either, and uh, it's just it's another thing like that wave. You just think it's going to crest, and it and it doesn't. But what do you think it is that's that's touching people's lives about this piece of plastic that has grooves cut, you know, stamped into it? I've always thought they sounded the best, but that's my personal opinion. Plenty of people are entitled to their opinion. I listen to CDs. I listen to streaming. So don't, I'm not a, 
Luddite like that. You know, I'll, 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 I'll I'll listen to it however way I get it, and it's fine. And my my computer desktop system is I listen to that more than anything. My wife listens to the Sono system because you know she says by the time it takes you to watch a record and turn on your stereo, I'm halfway through my James Taylor album. You know, bah, bah, bah. <laughs> but it's have to go Bing 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 fire rain. See that? See that? For five seconds. You're like if the record turns stereo on, wait thirty minutes with the cooker. And she goes Bing 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 Bing. But fire see, rain. That, that's one thing. Oh, that's one thing though, JJ. I think that for me. You know, when I was a kid and I tore the hell out of my mom's Beatles records, and that's an inside joke that we have on every show. But yeah. when I was a kid, I didn't give a shit about scratching them or messing them up. And now I, I, I really, really care about it. But I feel like my relationship with the music that I listen to now is exactly what you just said. It's the care. It's the time it takes. It's listening to an entire side. It's not just putting a digital device on shuffle and, and listening. And I think that if you have that attention span and, and the time to do that, I think it sinks into your head and your heart a lot more. Well, we sound like our dads. You know, in my day, we didn't have electricity. You know? <laughs> and, 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 and I don't want to sound like my dad, but the fact is when I wanted to learn a guitar solo, you know, you played the record, right? And then you played it again. And you played it again, and when you wore it down, you put a nickel on top of the tone arm because your thing knew was falling off. And <laughs> you played it again, and then you did it a hundred times, and you had to buy a new record because you destroyed it. Right? That's what we did. Yeah. There's a romanticism about it. There's a romanticism, and and they do sound really good. Look, there's some bad sounding records, and there's bad sounding digital, and there's great sounding records, and there's good sounding digital, and all works, and there's convenience involved. But I think, I think here's what I think: a lot of people who do buy vinyl but don't listen to, but don't but don't have a record player, they probably listen to the music online. Yeah. On Spotify yeah. and they look at the album cover. Yep. Yeah. Because they want to have a visceral you know, there's nothing sexy about a download and there's nothing sexy about a stream. There really isn't. <laughs> you know, whether you hold an album in your hands and you look at the information and the pictures and the producers and and, and I think that they they may not have record players but they listen to the music of the albums they buy they just like holding the album and plenty of albums make you do that offer you know they yeah. say here's the digital download right okay. yeah so i think that's what happens i think though i think the music you know you're going to get me a conversation about what do i think is good these days that's another whole other can of worms because <laughs> i don't hear things the way young people hear them i just don't but the same way my parents didn't hear what i heard yeah. Yeah. You know, my father hated you know everything. Well, my father's a classical music guy, so he thought we he thought everything after 1945 sucked. He made it, he made it really simple. He goes, you know your music. <laughs> this go, is yeah, the sure. cutoff. After he goes after 1945, all baby, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my dad. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, okay. So when my daughter comes in and plays Britney Spears' version of of, of Satisfaction, and I want to throw up and taser her, <laughs> I have to control myself. And say she's entitled to her. They're all entitled to their opinion. Now, I'm not a. I'm not a hip hop. I like some rap. Not a hip. I don't hear it. It's not. I'm a blues guy. First of all, I'm a blues guy. Yeah. It'd be really cool. I'm a rock guy. Beatles guy. Stone Pop. I'm a blues guy. I listen to blues all day long. That's my. That's just my calming music. That's like to me. That's what my. That's what classical music was to my dad. Yeah. Background makes sense. And just have it on all day. It makes me feel good. Yeah. I know all the artists, all their records. I know them. I can tell you who's playing what guitar and what song. I just love it. I love it, love it, love it. And some people love Coltrane, you know, and Miles mm. and all that. Stuff. And I, lately I've been playing a lot of Coltrane, a lot of Miles, because I say to myself, these guys are considered so great, and I want to understand why they're great. And, mm -hmm. and in order to understand why they're great, I have to do what I did with Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton and Stevie Ray and all that, which is listen to it a zillion times yeah. until it's in your brain. And you can kind of hear it like that. And then you can go, that's Miles. Yeah. At the, at the audio show, I was walking around. I went, whoa, they're playing Coltrane. Yeah. How'd you know that? Because I've been listening to a lot of Coltrane. I love listening to that stuff on vinyl. It's it's another worldly experience. Yeah. But... Another worldly, it's another experience. But you kind of have to... I, I find if, if a 20-year-old kid tells me he loves vinyl, or she tells me, like, they love vinyl... I'm very impressed because they didn't grow up with the visceral connection to it that we did. Remember, right. in our day, the records that were played on the radio were vinyl records that yeah. were being spun on the radio station. Yeah. 
there were not digital tracks yeah. coming off a radio station. Yeah. So we heard things with vinyl, and it's a very different sound. I, I'm beyond arguing with someone whether it's better or not. I just said I hear it. I understand yeah. it. I get it. It makes me feel good. And it's obviously, look how popular it is. It's right. ridiculously popular. Yeah. And I'm very grateful that it's ridiculously popular. Oh, me too. JJ, we we cannot thank you enough for regaling us with these yeah, for the, stories. For the five-hour interview, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> it, no, I mean, you know, you are the first person that Roger said that we should talk to. And the fact that, he, you know, he handed you off to us. And I know that scheduling was an issue. It always seems to be with, you know, us doing the crazy shit that we do for a living. But uh, it, it's it's so great to to not just hear from someone who's famous, because that has nothing to do with it. The passion that you have for it, the love that you have for it, how it's drilled into your head. Uh, that's what really means a lot and yeah. comes through and comes across. John and I cannot thank you enough for taking the time, for, for well, sharing like it to, with us and the people that listen to the show. I'd like to remind all the listeners here that I do have a podcast. It's called the JJ French Connection, and it's available on Spotify and Apple and everything else. It's JJ French, J A Y J A Y F R E N C H. The JJ French Connection. Beyond the music, there's a lot of great people. There's 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 recording artists. There's actors. There's there's uh, singers. There's producers. There's doctors. Because I'm a Jewish guy, I get sick a lot. So there's a lot of doctors on my show. You know, and, uh, um, no. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so no, there are actually. You know, I've, had two, I've had two heart operations and prostate cancer. I've had my doctors on the show. You know, to just, oh. I'm actually on several boards for these hospitals. So it's another whole thing which we're not going to get into. But I have that, and then I have my book out, which is Twisted Business, available on Amazon. And and that book tells the story of Twisted Sister. And if you saw the, oh, the documentary, by the way, is now available online through Thunderflix, which is a UK based heavy metal video channel it's awesome. a subscription video that just started awesome. and um they they debuted with with um twisted fucking we're a twisted fucking sister because the guy who's the president of that thunderflix is a good friend of mine and he had me on his show to debut the, so anytime you want to watch me a twisted fucking sister i certainly don't need to watch it anymore, <laughs> but, uh, you can get it on thunderflix and get my book and we have twisted business. The book is fantastic. The podcast is fantastic. The documentary is fantastic. Wheels, did you have? Yeah, I, it's a sidetrack. Okay. Because French Connection, best car chase ever. Oh, God, yes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh God, yes. It and Bullet yeah, yeah, are yeah, right yeah, up there. Yeah, yeah, but you know, yeah, but you know, but my stupid short stack of, of DVD movies that I watch like Ad Infinitum just to make me happy because I'm just <laughs> that boring. Is as Weekend at Bernie's. That's like on the top. <laughs> that, that, at, uh, yeah, as much like a film buff as I am. It's not Citizen Kane. It's not you know. It's it's Weekend at Bernie's. It's um, uh, Enter the Dragon is on that pile. Oh. Um, West Side Story is on that pile. Of course, The Godfather is on that pile. Um, and um, Jaws is on that pile. Yeah. Oh. And yeah. and I just saw I just saw a Broadway show called The Shark Is Broken. If you're a jo you're a Jaws fan. Oh, oh, oh yeah. yeah yeah yeah. And I've heard about so that show. So you know why it's called the shark is broken because uh, because on the vineyard the, the shark kept breaking and yeah. it has microphones all over the place they didn't know if they were going to act or not and if the shark is broken <laughs> the shark is working and so Robert Shaw's son found a diary that his father kept of all the arguments that him and Roy Scheider and and Richard uh, had during the filming because it was stuck on the boat. <laughs> it was so long and they really started to get on each other's fucking nerves. So his father kept a lot of their crazy conversations and they wrote a play around the frustration of filming Jaws. <laughs> and the three main actors, the actor who played Richard Dreyfus was amazing. The actor who played Roy Scheider was amazing. And Robert Shaw's son, Ian, played him. Oh. And he looked and sounded just like him. I saw, oh, I, I saw a photo of him recently. It, it's unbelievable. Yeah, right. So that's... um. That's kind of that's kind of cool. So anyway, that's why that's why I bide my time with. But yes, the car chase and French connection certainly. <laughs> JJ, right thank you so much for joining us. the The passion, the love for all of this that shines through, and we can't thank you enough, man. Thank you guys. I'll and also thank Mark Mendoza, Eddie Ojeda, D. Snyder, and the, uh, AJ Perro. Rest in peace. 
these have been my brothers. These people stood shoulder to shoulder for more hours, more years than any of our marriages possibly could have lasted. And no shit. It was just, it was a war. And any band that's lasted that many years, whether it's Sabbath, Kiss, you know, all the, you know, Aerosmith, all that shit. My hat's off to all of them for the, for, the, for the wars that we lived through and the fact that we're still here. Because I can tell you this, in 1973, if, when Aerosmith started, Kiss started, Priest started, ACDC started, and Twisted started. If you asked any of us how long we would last, we would have said maybe five years. And maybe. And here we are 50 years later and still, and still making a difference. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thanks, JJ. Have a good one, JJ. Bye-bye.